You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. R-E-S-P-E-C-T, find out what it means to me. R-E-S-P-E-C-T, take it, D-C-B. Sock it to me, 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 sock it to well, that's why they didn't name the song that. That's a good point. <laughs> hey, everybody. How are you doing on this fine day? You are watching slash listening to the Command Zone podcast. I'm your host, Jimmy Wong. How's it? It's Josh Lee Kwai. Today, we're going to be talking about Judith the Scourge Diva. Ah. And, well, we uh, have mics in front of us. I don't yeah, know why I held <laughs> you held up mic. a fake mic in front of a real mic. <laughs> that's, that's meta. Um, so we're doing something a little different here. In the past, what we've done is we've let game nights come out. You see the decks in action, and mm-hmm. then we do a deck tech or two about some of the decks that you saw in Game Nights. But we kind of thought it might be interesting to reverse that. So we're going to be, over the next couple of weeks, talking about the decks we're going to play in the next Game Nights. So that when you watch Game Nights, you kind of have an idea of how the decks work and you know what they might be able to do as you're watching it. And, mm-hmm. and we think that might be a better way to go. Of course, as always, you can let us know if you agree and or like it the old way or whatever. But this time around, I'm going to be talking about Judith today. And then next week, Jimmy's going to be talking about his deck that he's going to play in Game Nights, uh, which is Lavinia. Mm -hmm. And that Game Nights comes out January 25th. That's right. So So mark your calendars. You're going to be able to see these decks in action. But before we get into all that, we're going to talk about a bunch of cards, including new cards from Ravnica Allegiance. If you want to pick any of this stuff up, please go to cardkingdom.com slash command zone. If you use that affiliate link when you order cards for a deck, you know, if you want to build this deck or any deck at all, any cards you need for anything you've got or you want to pre-order the Ravnica Allegiance stuff, you really are helping us out when you do that and helping keep the lights on, helping this podcast, Game Nights, Extra Turns, all of our content. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a we have a very special story that came to us in the email about uh, Card Kingdom's customer service. A guy named Benjamin Pullen wanted to send us a feel-good story. Oh, yeah, this is cool. He wanted to build a Madrotha deck over Christmas, and his wife ordered 50 cards and some stuff to bling it out. But unfortunately, uh, the delivery, they left it on their porch, which happens a lot around Christmas time. And something else that's happened a lot around Christmas time is that it was stolen off of his porch. And they were super bummed out. They filed a police report. They said, well, there's nothing we can do about it. Card Kingdom replaced the entire thing for free. And they also threw in some extra swag. And basically, you know, turn this Christmas around for this guy. He also has a six-year-old daughter. They love watching game nights together. So his wife used Car Kingdom because they sponsored us. And I guess that's how the message got passed along. So that's, that's a pretty great story because amazing. honestly, Card Kingdom's not responsible for the, 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 directly for the delivery, right? They use oh, yeah. USPS or whatever they mm-hmm. use. And for them to replace this stuff, uh, it just shows what good customer service Card Kingdom has. Yeah, uh, Can't be more proud to have a really great sponsor like them yep. behind our show. Uh, and another awesome sponsor that we have is Ultra Pro. You know, Ravnica Allegiance came out. So if you're going to build this deck today, which is Judith, you're going to want the Rakdos sleeves, the Rakdos deck boxes. You can get the Blood Crypt play mat. So you can get all the accoutrement that goes along. Good word that makes your battlefield really themed around your commander. I know I always have a lot of respect when somebody's like, yep, I'm going to play my Simic deck with my Simic sleeves on my Simic, <laughs> Simic play mat. And I always Slimic. feel like, I always feel like, man, you got, you got it together. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah, I need to be more like that sometimes. It's like wearing matching clothes. <laughs> yeah, their theme is on point. And the final way to support the show is directly through Patreon at patreon.com slash command zone. And we do something special every week. We call it one lucky patron on the show as a thank you. And that person this week is Seth Thom. Or maybe Tome. Tome. T-H-O-M-E. I Seth. Can, yeah. You rock. You rock. Thanks. All right. Let's get right into it here. Judith, the Scourge Diva. This is the new, one of the new Rakdos legendary creatures uh, from Ravnica Allegiance. I'll read it real quick. It is one, a black and a red for a 2-2 human shaman, legendary creature, of course, says other creatures you control get plus one, plus zero. Nice. And also, whenever a non-token creature you control dies, Judith deals one damage to any target. Any target. That includes players and planeswalkers and or creatures. Right. So remember, it's it's non-token creature you right. control. But when one dies, Judith starts pinging stuff for one damage. I like this a lot. It's Very. an interesting card. I, I think 
you know, when I saw it, it felt felt a little underpowered mm -hmm. compared to, you know, Vanifar or something like that. <laughs> uh, but, and, and also the two abilities are kind of weird, right? Like one's an anthem effect that makes your creatures bigger. In general, you want to have a lot of creatures, but... Like tokens? Yeah, like tokens. But she she says whenever a non-token creature dies, she does the other part. Like it, Right. I feel like they could have taken the word non-token off this card and it would have been much better, but still not broken. That was, when I saw mm -hmm. it the first time, that was my first thought. Why does it say non-token? If it just right. allowed to do this, it probably would be too good in like limited or standard or something. It's not, definitely not because it would be too good in commander. Yeah, and black red does have a lot of token shenanigans in general when they make black red sets or, yeah. or in limited. It's Goblins about, make like, tons of tokens, yeah, it's right? like steal some cards with an act of treason and then sack it to something. You yeah. know? So they like sacrificing things, but... You know, it's a little underpowered in that way, but I still think the effect that she has is great because it's very flexible. Yeah, so I actually, as I was building the deck, and the way that works for Game Nights, I think we've talked about this before, but in general, obviously there's four players in Game Nights. Mm -hmm. Jimmy and I will be two of them. There's two guests, and the guests, we just because we're on the show all the time, we let them choose from the pool of legendary creatures first, and then they pick, and then Jimmy and I usually powwow and go, you know, is there one you really want? If there yeah. is, you can build that. But in general, we pick. And so, you know, I, I didn't have the first pick. And I kind of, I looked at Rakdos, the showstopper. showstopper. Coin flippy. Coin flippy. And just from a production standpoint, dealing with all the <laughs> coin flips and figuring out how to edit that production-wise and make it work on the show, I just decided that I didn't want to deal with that. And so I picked Judith. Uh, thinking like, ah, it probably won't be the most powerful. We'll see what I can do with it. And as I built the deck, I was like, oh, this is going to be better than I thought. This can do yeah. some stuff. I think this is better than Raxos the Showstopper in terms of a build around. Um, Maybe. Just because, I mean, Raxos the Showstopper is a semi-board wipe on a stick, and it may limit you to travel synergies. And this is everything Black Red that wants to die. Yeah. So which Black Red a lot of stuff wants to die. So yeah. that is what I settled on for the strategy of the deck when I was brewing it. It's an aristocrat style deck. That's... We use Aristocrats as a shorthand because there's some cards that exist. Falcon Wrath Aristocrat. Falcon Wrath Aristocrat, yeah. Uh, Cartel Aristocrat's another one. Mm -hmm. It basically means sacking your own creatures over and over for value. Yeah, and usually the Aristocrats deck will also drain people of life and give you life or other, you know, like... Um, there's... It, it, it takes advantage of death triggers, yeah. though, to do that generally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that was the general strategy going in was really taking advantage of Judith's second ability, which is when a non-token creature you control dies, she starts throwing around one damage here and there. So the first thing you need in a deck like that is creatures that want to die. All of them. Specifically non-token creatures. So it did kind of change from the normal aristocrats deck mm -hmm. as far as like in those decks, you, you sort of want to play cards that make a lot of creatures like token creatures, like a, a a card that comes in and creates two tokens with it is usually good in an aristocrat's deck, right? right? Like a mere battle sphere yeah. would be amazing in this deck if it was token creatures too. Right. So I was looking for creatures that weren't tokens that wanted to die. And there's kind of a suite of them. There's a there's mm -hmm. a, a grouping of cards that they kind of bring themselves back from the graveyard. They don't mind dying. This yeah, is like the most famous one, right? Definitely. I think this one is, it's been reprinted a ton of times. You've probably played against it if you play Law Limited. It's a reassembling skeleton. It's just a one in the black for a 1-1 one, one skeleton warrior. And it has an activated ability, one in the black, return reassembling skeleton from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. So this is something that just costs the same as its casting costs. You can just repeatedly come back from your graveyard to the battlefield for two mana. So it doesn't mind dying because it doesn't care. If it's in the graveyard, it's basically the same as if it's in your hand. Yeah, he's kind of like those uh, enemies in Mario where you jump on them. They're like the little tur turtles yes. with the skeletons, and they're like... I just come right they back. come right back, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's Nether Traitor, which is two mana for a 1-1 one, one with haste and shadow. Shadow means this creature can block or be blocked only by creatures with shadow. Uh, but it says whenever another creature is put into your graveyard from play, you can pay black. And if you do, you return Nether Trader from your graveyard to play. Hmm. I like these cards that go directly into play, not to your hand and then to play. Yeah. More than I like the other ones. But, you know, we may we may still have to do uh, the former, the latter, the whatever that. <laughs> we may still have to do one of those a little bit. That synergizes well, too, because things are constantly going to be entering your graveyard. And it only costs one man to bring back. So later on, we'll talk about sack outlets, but you can gain a mana advantage sometimes by doing stuff like that. Right. And Nether Trader with Reassembling Skeleton, right? It's like mm -hmm. sack Nether Trader, sack Reassembling Skeleton. That's a creature dying going to your graveyard. Pay the one black Nether Trader comes back out. Re, re, uh, or pay the one in a black for Reassembling Skeleton. And so for three mana, you basically 
just cycled your cards in and out of the graveyard, which is what you want to do. Yeah. Um, Bloodgast. Black, yes. black for a vampire spirit 2-1. It can't block, and it has haste as long as an opponent has 10 or less life. These are all things that really don't matter that much for Commander. But Landfall, whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, you may return Bloodgast from your graveyard to the battlefield. Not even tapped, just right there. Yep. So it's Landfall basically does what Reassembling Skeleton does or nether trader but instead of those other mana requirements you just have to play a land fetch land we'll mm-hmm. let it come back twice right right play the fetch it comes back sack it now sack activate the fetch, the fetch yeah. brings in a land right there's there are certain uh, infinite combos with blood gas for infinite mana that certain people play in in a lot of those landfall type decks yep um so it's a good card and then there are two versions of <laughs> squee and squee goblin to bob this is a jimmy favorite and squee the immortal I think the Squee the Immortal is one of my new favorites because they're both they're both cool and they both sort of do the same thing in a different way. So Squee Goblin to Bob, if it's in your graveyard, sorry, it's two and a red for a one one. At the beginning of your upkeep, you may return it from your graveyard to your hand. So sacking it costs you nothing except for the three mana to cast it. That's mm-hmm. not as good as putting it onto the battlefield, but you know, you you use the top cards and then you use cards that are like, well, this is still good. It's not as good as Blood Gas, right. but it still works. And then Squee the Immortal is one red red for a two one. And it says you may cast Squee the Immortal from your graveyard or from exile. So if it gets killed, you can just cast it again, similar to Reassembling Skeleton. This is actually yeah. a little better than Goblin to Bob because it comes into play. You cast it. Just has a slightly harder casting cost. I guess these cards are in terms of not going straight to the battlefield, or you have to pay a little more to do it. They they almost feel like like worst gas for your car. Yeah, you know, like, yeah, you yeah, exactly. Your car, but, but it's great. still it's still gonna make it run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's not like high octane yeah. <laughs> premium <laughs> not gas. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I think Squee the Immortal is quite a bit better because you might have turns where you want to sack a creature multiple times because yeah. you have the man and whatever. Goblin to Bob is really limited in that it goes to your graveyard and then. Your next turn, you get it back. Yeah, your upkeep. Yeah, so. it's fine. It's if I was gonna cut one, I would cut Goblin to Bob. But even though it, he looks way happier and yeah. way, you know <laughs> he's like hugging something, whereas oh, it's the same skull. I think it's the same thing. Yeah, it is. In both of them, he's got that skull. In yeah, one he's just more happy with it, and the other one he looks like he's about to throw it. <laughs> I love this. Squee the immortal. You got to be pretty smart to live long as me, but not being able to die helps. <laughs> it's true. I don't know how this kid became immortal. I need to study my lore more. So speaking of dying, we need these creatures to die I for Judith's ability to trigger. And so, you know, you can't just say, like, my creature dies. You need a card that allows you to sacrifice your creatures so that they'll die and you can start doing other things. So we need sacrifice outlets. Yes. Um, and one of the ones that we talked about, one of the cards that we underrated, and now Josh, actually I noticed a couple of these in this deck, it is Yeheni Undying Partisan, two in a black for a 2-2 legendary Aetherborn Vampire. Has haste, and whenever a creature in opponent controls dies, play a plus one plus one counter on Yeheni Undying Partisan, which actually goes kind of well with Judith if you're yep. going to be taking creatures out and making a thing that people have to block. But more importantly, sacrifice another creature, Yeheni gains indestructible until end of turn. We have talked many times about how a sacrifice outlet that just allowed you for free to sacrifice your creature at instant speed would be good. That's basically what Yeheni is. Yeah. There's incidental. The yeah. There's incidental value in that. If other creatures your opponent's control dies, it starts getting big. And I've seen games where it's big enough to be a threat. Mm-hmm. But really, you're playing it because you want to sack your reassembling skeleton and your blood gas and bring them back in. And yeah. Judith triggers and then triggers again and then triggers again. And you know Yeheni's just the enabler. I'm thinking of a situation, too, where let's say your opponent has three blockers and X amount of life, and you start sacking things to Judith to start either pinging them in the face or to grow your Yeheni to kill their creatures. Kill their creatures, grow your Yeheni, and then hit them with Yeheni. So if you know that you're not going to be stopped in combat, you could actually be doing more damage with Yeheni if you can clear some blockers out of the way. Also, Yeheni is gets indestructible when you sacrifice yeah. things, so it can be a good blocker, right? If you have Yeheni, a reassembling skeleton, just sitting there, and somebody attacks you with something big, you can block with Yeheni, sack the reassembling skeleton, yeah. and just basically two mana to save yourself a bunch of life or damage in that case. I guess you can just block with the reassembling skeleton, too. Yeheni does just keep going up in terms yeah. of its its usefulness. It's just way better than it looked. We were very yeah. wrong about the card. Yeah. Uh, the next card is... Probably the best card in the deck and is often the best card in the deck when it's included in a deck. Yeah. It's Skull Clamp. It's one mana for an artifact, uh, one to equip. and Oh, sorry. It's an equipment, obviously. <laughs> uh, equip creature gets plus one, negative one. And whenever equip creature dies, you draw two cards. Yep. 
So with Reassembly Skeleton, Squee, they all have one toughness. Skull Clamp becomes, you know, pay two mana, draw two cards, and then you use your recursion abilities on those things to kind yeah. of keep, like, Nether Trader and Blood Gas, sweet, clamp one, clamp the other, get Nether Trader back out, get a land because you've drawn so many cards, get Blood Gas back out, clamp again, clamp again. You can get into some pretty good value loops with Skull Clamp. Yep, and it kills your creature more importantly because I think it's important to note that Judith just wants creatures to die, not yep. for you to sacrifice them. Also, quick R&D note, they were like, this card would be too good if it was just one mana, one equip, plus one, plus one. Yeah. And then they think, so they're like, you know what, we'll make it minus one on the toughness side so they get a little weaker. They were trying to make a downside on the card and they actually made they it They made better. it an absurd upside. It would be so much worse if it was plus one, plus one. Oh, it would be awful. I mean, it would still be fine. I think it would still be a good card. Well, but... I guess the draw two cards thing is still pretty appealing. But yeah, yeah, but I, it would be way there. worse. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, Man, black red decks do love this card, including my own. It's Sadistic Hypnotist. Three black black for a 2-2 two, two human minion. You're like, wait a minute, those stats suck. Hold up. Sacrifice creature. Target player discards two cards. Activate this ability only anytime you can cast a sorcery. So this is on your turn only, but if you have enough things that can die and you can bring them back, you can basically strip people's hands away entirely, which is really brutal. Really scary. Yeah. Just think with Reassembly Skeleton. It becomes pay two mana get two cards from somebody's hand. You yeah. might do that three times, get six cards in a turn, just just to, you know, take one player basically out of the game out for a couple game, terms. Out of the game, yeah, yeah. At least for plays off the board. Of course, both the altars, Ashnod's altar and Phyrexian altar are in the deck. These are the best sack outlets besides Skull Clamp. Mm -hmm. You pay three for either of them. They're both artifacts. Ashnod's, you sacrifice a creature and add two colorless mana to your mana pool or two diamond mana. And Phyrexian, you sacrifice a creature and you add one color of any, or one mana of any color. Yeah. They're both awesome, and with uh, certain cards, you can sort of endlessly recur or get into loops because then you're creating the mana to bring the thing back. Yeah, great cards. Pretty yeah. much those two altars are a must in any deck that wants to sacrifice stuff. Yep. Another card I really like, you and I... Both these at the same time, yeah. Honestly. There are two lands that allow you to sacrifice creatures, and it's High Market and Phyrexian Tower. So High Market, you can tap it to add one to your mana pool, or you can sack it, tap it to sack a creature and to gain a life. So it's a great way to protect things if someone's trying to steal it, as well as just activate Judith. And Phyrexian Tower, legendary land, you can tap it to add one colorless mana, or you can tap it to sack a creature and add black, black to your mana pool. That is actually very spicy. Yeah. Because all of a sudden, look, now this land generates the mana you need to bring back a reassembling skeleton and do many, many other things. Yeah, even just on its face, Phyrexian Tower is like, tap it, sacrifice reassembling skeleton, it dies, you get two black mana, Judith pings something for one, and then you use the two black mana, bring Reassembling Skeleton back. Like, Yeah, it's a great way to also ramp yep. on early turns if you're able to get these cards out because your engine isn't necessarily going on turn three or four, but you may need to cast a bigger creature to get it going. And being able to sack something like a skeleton makes it you know that much easier to play your big spells. All right, so we have a bunch of sack outlets in the deck. We have a bunch of creatures that want to oh, die, so bring close. themselves back. And now we need another category here, which is like, you know, it's like other synergy. So Judith is giving you value when your creatures die, but mm -hmm. one damage is just not a ton. You also want to get further value from death. So we've got a few cards in the deck that kind of also want your creatures to die. Yeah. So the first one is Grim Haruspex. Haruspex? Haruspex? I was always said Haruspex, but that sounds... Grim Haruspex. It's two, <laughs> it's two and a black for a 3-2 human wizard. It has morph, and you can unmorph it for a black. That doesn't matter that much. But it says, whenever another non-token creature you control dies, draw a card. Hey. So now you're getting to those reassembly skeleton loops. You know, you don't have to go infinite. It's just you do it two or three times, draw two or three cards, deal two or three damage with Judith. Yeah. You start really getting your engine going with stuff like this. I like, like to see cards like this kind of like an enchantment almost. Mm -hmm, just mm -hmm. one that dies easily. <laughs> Actually, I would rather it was an enchantment than a creature. But I guess oh, yeah. you can sacrifice it to some of these other things if you True. have to, if you're in a pinch. So, All right, next up, Pitiless Plunderer. Um, I love it when I see uncommons in EDH decks because you're always just like, how did I this escape my grasp? <laughs> Human Pirate 1-4, one whenever another to uh, creature you control dies, create a colorless treasure artifact token with tap, sacrifice this artifact, add one mana of any color to your mana pool. So now this is this gets nasty in this deck because all of a sudden, instead of making, let's say, one mana with a Phyrexian Altar, you're making a mana and something that can tap and sacrifice for any mana as well. You're so think of Phyrexian up. Altar, that, and Reassembling Skeleton. Now I have infinite Reassembling Skeletons dying and coming back. That right. immediately will win with Judas because... 
what you do is you sack your reassembling skeleton to Phyrexian Altar, create a black mana. That creates a treasure token. Mm -hmm. Now you sacrifice the treasure and use the black mana to bring the reassembling skeleton back. When it died, Judith did one damage to something. Now you do that over and over, just gun everybody down. Yeah, and if you do it with Ashnaz Altar, you're still going to get the black mana from the Pitiless Plunderer, so you get infinite colorless mana. Infinite mana and infinite damage if Judith is out. Um, so it's a really good one. Pawn of Lulamog will do a slightly similar thing. It doesn't create colored mana. It actually doesn't create mana. It creates a creature. So Pawn of Lulamog, one black black for 2-2 two, two, Vampire Shaman. When Pawn of Lulamog or another non-token creature you control dies, you can create a 0-1 Eldrazi spawn creature token. And Eldrazi spawn have the ability to sacrifice this creature, add colorless mana to your mana pool. So it creates a sort of treasure mm -hmm. that only can be tapped for colorless. But again, you can get into loops, but they're not super easy to go infinite, but it's pretty easy to go a lot. Yeah. And sometimes that's all you need. Yeah. Like, you know. I don't need my reassembling skeleton or whatever, any of those recurring creatures, to come back infinitely. But if it comes back just 40 times or 20 <laughs> times, that's still going to be enough to do a lot. Yeah. So It's kind of crazy how reassembling skeleton is literally the best creature in the deck. <laughs> yeah, it kind of is. Yeah. <laughs> um, next up, Dictate of Erebos. We've seen this card many times before. Three black black with an enchantment for, with flash. Whenever a creature you control dies, each opponent sacrifices a creature. Each opponent obviously having mad value in commander. Not to mention you're also doing damage. You're already affecting people's boards by threatening to get rid of their creatures or planeswalkers just by pinging them. So Dictate is an obvious run in any kind of deck that wants a lot of their own creatures to die. Yeah. Yeah. It just, while you're doing your thing, you're really taking their board yeah. and just smashing it. I've seen games just get lost as, as soon as that card hits the table because someone goes, I just can't do anything. Even if I draw removal for it next turn, it it's too late. Narset decks and those kind of decks that are going to have one creature that they're really banking on. Right. They just can't beat that card. It's really tough. Edicts. Okay. So I know what you're thinking because I was thinking this as I was building it. This is great. I can get into these loops and whatever, but Judith is doing one damage. So if it's not infinite, yeah, how do you make that impactful in some way? And one of my favorite ways to, to do this is, you'll notice it says, when another non-token creature you control dies, Judith deals one damage to any target. So mm -hmm. Judith is the source of the damage, which means I can give Judith death touch. In which case, one damage now becomes kill any creature. You made another J Tim deck, didn't right. you, Josh? This is something I learned <laughs> with the Tim deck, and it's very useful very often, as it turns out. So there's two go-tos. They're artifacts, they're equipment. They both give death, death touch. One we even made a little short uh, comedy film about. If That's you haven't right. seen Kitchen Table Fables, you should just uh, go into YouTube and type Kitchen Table Fables Basilisk Collar, yep. and it will come up. And the card, of course, is Basilisk Collar. It's one mana equipment, costs two to equip. Gives the creature Death Touch and Lifelink. And then Gorgon Flail is the other one. That's a two-mana equipment, cost two to equip. And it gives the creature plus one, plus one, and Death Touch. And both of these equipped to Judith now mean that when you're sacrificing any of your non-token creatures, Judith is murking a creature. Yep, Death Ping, I yeah. guess, in this case. If you have Grave Pact out, uh, now everyone's losing a creature and you're killing a creature yeah. like it's pretty it, it it can get like you can kill all the creatures on the board it's not that hard you know it's funny judith can also target your own creatures so, so it can be a sack outlet <laughs> yeah for, so she's yeah. kind of your own sack outlet for any one power uh if you have these collars on than anything but otherwise your one toughness creatures all die to her um okay so that's the sort of making judith deadly category give her death touch and then there are all those recursive creatures in the deck, this skeleton, goblin, nabob, all that stuff, but you have other creatures, and I wanted ways to be able to recur the other creatures that mm -hmm. are in the deck, or also make the reassembling skeletons and nether traders even more sticky, even more uh, recursive. And so there's two cards that kind of help us with that. This is a fav Jimmy favorite. I love this card. Yeah. Um, I played it in my Neheb deck. It almost brought me back to win the game. Yep but not far it's enough. It's very powerful. It's Balthor the Defile. Two black black for a creature, a zombie dwarf legend. He's a legend. He's a 2-2. Two -two. He gives all minions plus one, plus one. Pretty sure that does not apply to this deck. But black, 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 remove Balthor the Defile from the game. Each player returns all black and all red creature cards from his or her graveyard to play. So this is one of the single most powerful ways to get in a black red deck to get everything back all at once it's not living death where everyone gets everything back it's black and red if your table has not got that many people playing those colors and this is even better but it doesn't really matter because even if they do bring a lot of stuff back and you have judith out you are set to go off yeah immediately you, yeah you can set up your graveyard in a way that like oh i get pillars plunder back and something else and now on that turn i'm gonna go off with yeah. the stuff 
Balthor is very, very powerful. Really powerful with the next card, which is on this uh, further recursion category. It's Machaeus the Unhallowed, just reprinted in Ultimate Masters. Three black, black, black for a 5-5 legendary zombie cleric. Has Intimidate. It also says whenever a human deals damage to you, destroy it. Which Some, is very relevant sometimes. Yeah, They're, which is nice. Humans the most printed, uh, I think, creature type. Yep. Uh, but the big text is other non-human creatures you control get plus one, plus one, and have undying. So Vampires? that means... Yeah, undying means that when a creature with undying dies, if it had no plus one uh, counters on it, you return it to the battlefield under its owner's control with a plus one, plus one counter on it. So all of our creatures that have their own recursion, reassembling skeleton, blood gas, nether trader, squeeze, and a number of other creatures in the deck will now bounce back from the graveyard immediately with mm -hmm. an undying trigger. And think of, we keep talking about uh, reassembling skeleton just because it's the best example. But think about reassembling skeleton. I sack it, it has not dying, it immediately comes back. And I sack it again, because it has a plus one, plus one counter, it stays in the graveyard, but now I just pay the one in the black. So now I'm paying one in a black for right. it to come back every uh, twice. Right. Which is, with Ashnod's Altar and things, very, very powerful. Pull. Yeah, I think with Phyrexian Altar, you can sack it twice for free and you just get the exact cost to bring it back. So then that immediately is infinite right there. Right, so with Judith, you just win. I think, too, when you have these ways to gain mana when you're using this deck, and it's important to be like, I don't always need to just win when I do this stuff with Judith because let's say you make a ton of mana and then you can pop out a very powerful spell or equip Skull Clamp a bunch of times. And yep. that might just be enough to set you up to do something even bigger and better the next turn if you're not under immediate danger. And if you are, Judith is pretty good at taking care of that. In yeah, terms she of getting might... rid of creatures, getting rid of players' life tolls, planeswalkers, basilisk calling her, all that stuff. Yeah, it might be like, oh, I can do this. I can sack Squee, you know, seven times with seven undying triggers he's gonna come out 14 times that's 14 judith triggers with a basilisk collar yeah i can take care of all the creatures on the board and deal four damage to somebody that's pretty good yeah <laughs> like <laughs> you, a black red deck that's yeah. very good you didn't win but you you could you were basically saying like and next turn i can do that again again yeah yeah, yeah. so pretty good but there is combo potential in the deck uh, it's hard to build this deck without some combo potential. Mm -hmm. I don't generally love infinite combos, but as you're building synergy, you just find them. So I wanted to talk about some, and I thought it would be really crazy not to uh, include this next card, which is a well-known combo enabler. Yeah, it's Nim Death Mantle. Two mana for an artifact equipment, and the equipped creature gets plus two, plus two, has Intimidate, and is a black zombie. And by the way, this actually combos with Machaeus because it turns them <laughs> from a non-human. It's into not a saying, it doesn't say in addition to its other types. It just yeah. becomes a zombie. Whenever a non-token creature is put into your graveyard from the battlefield, you may pay four generic mana. If you do, return that card to the battlefield and attach Nim Death Mantle to it. And its equip cost is also four. So basically, it doesn't need to be equipped to a creature to see it. It just needs to be on the battlefield. If it goes away, four mana brings it right back. Yep. And so you can get two of that mana refunded if you're using National Adulter to sack that creature. So now, if like you said, if you've got Machaeus and it's going to bounce back on its own, then you might be able to just pay for, like let's say you have Ashnod's Altar, mm -hmm. Machaeus, Nim Death, Mantle, and another creature. You sack the creature for two mana. It comes back because of Machaeus. You sack it for two more mana. Uh oh. Because of Undying, it wouldn't come back, but you pay the four mana you just paid, or you just made with Ashnod's Altar right. into Nim Death, Mantle. It comes back. Now it sacks, comes back because of Undying. Now you're in an infinite loop of sacking that creature over and over. Dude right. is going to kill everybody with her one damage. It also works good with creatures that create other creatures. So there's two in the deck. I didn't put a lot because this isn't something I wanted to really do that much because it's an infinite combo. But, but if it happened to come up, if any creature that creates at least one other creature when it comes in and you have Ashnod's Altar will go infinite with Nim Death Mantle. Mm -hmm. It used to be that like, you could do that, but what's happening? But Judith gives you the what's happening. She says every time a non-token creature dies, she deals one damage. So if you can just have a creature die over and over, you're going to da-da-da-da-da, say hello to my little friend. The whole yeah, table. and take everybody out. So the two creatures that I put in the deck that create other creatures when they come in are... Grave Titan. And Siege Gang Commander. Both great cards on their own. Which is why I chose those two. Yeah. Grave Titan, I think, is one of those cards where every time I'm making a deck with black in it, I always look at it and go... Yeah, I could, and I probably should play it. You're, you're never going to be embarrassed to cast Grave Titan, yeah. even if it has nothing to do with your deck. <laughs> well, it's four black black for a 6-6 six, six death touch, which is great on its own, but when it enters the battlefield or attacks, you put two 2-2 two, two black zombie creature tokens on the battlefield. Not tapped, just you get extra four power for playing it and for attacking with it. And it's death touch, so it's very hard to block. 
Yeah, so this with Nim Deathmantle and Ashnod's obviously you can sack the two zombies that come in when it ETBs for four mana, sack right. the Grave Titan for a sixth mana, yeah. and then use four of it to bring Grave Titan back out, gets two zombies over and over again, that works. Yeah, and eventually you're going to get an extra mana, enough mana from Grave Titan where you don't have to sack the zombies. So you, you can essentially say with this combo, I get infinite zombies on the table. Right. Uh, and another thing I like about stuff like Grave Titan, because, listen, A, you don't always want to go infinite. B, you're not always going to have Nim Death Mantle. But... And I know Judith says non-token creature, but mm -hmm. you're still in a deck that has a ton of sack outlets and just wants fodder to sack because you might have skull clamp outer and other things like that. And you're just like, I'm just going to use these zombies. I'm going to attach skull clamp, sack them to something mm -hmm. and draw cards. Or still having tokens is good, even though Judith herself says non-token. Grave Pact and Dictate of Air both, right. they still work if tokens die. So you can kind of get value off that. CG and Commander, similar thing. It's three red red for a 2-2 two, two goblin. When it enters the battlefield, it comes with three 1-1 one, one red goblins. But then also, you can pay one and a, and a red, sacrifice a goblin, and CG and Commander deals two damage to any target. CG and Commander also com or synergizes with your Basilisk Callers and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of cross synergy that those are that's the reason those are the two that I chose because you can use like Marsh Flitter and some other things. Right. Uh, Pawn of Ulamog actually coincidentally will do the Nim Death Mantle thing too because when it dies, it creates a spawn that you can then sack to Ashnod's Altar to make more mana to, right. for the Nim Death Mantle to bring out. So it's also cross synergistic, as it were. Yeah. I like all of these cards. Yeah. So here's the thing about combo potential too. And there's a card I put in that may look weird on the surface, but there's two cards in the deck that you really, really sometimes <laughs> want to get. So it's Godo Bandit Warlord. Five and a red for a legendary creature, Human Barbarian. It's a 3-3, three, three, but it says when Godo enters the battlefield, you may search your library for an equipment card and put it onto the battlefield. And then it also has text, whenever Godo attacks for the first time each turn, untap it and all samurai you control. After this phase, there's an additional combat phase. That part doesn't matter much. This I'm using as a tutor for an equipment. Tutor, onto the battlefield, too. Tutor an equipment yeah. onto the battlefield. And then it gives you a body you can sack mm -hmm. for some value. And so you can get Nim Death Mantle. You can get Skull Clamp. I think on the show I've talked about many times just running um, Steel Shaper's Gift Yeah. When in a deck that only has Skull Clamp in it. Because I figure if I don't have Skull Clamp, I really want to get it. And if yeah. I already have it, I don't care if I have a dead card in my hand because I have Skull Clamp, so I have a million cards. <laughs> so this is kind of filling that same role because we don't have white in this deck. Can't run Steel Shaper's Gift. Yeah, you're not... I mean, you have other tutors you could play or you could just six mana make sure you... I mean, you're almost... I feel like getting Skull Clamp or Nim Death Mantle out and those are your top hits if you're yeah. going to be tutoring in this deck. And you're in black, so you're going to run Vampiric and Demonic and you're going to have ways to find the key pieces. Yeah. That doesn't mean... Again, I wouldn't necessarily play this to combo off all the time, but there are games where it's like it's been going on a while, it needs to end... And also, just getting Skull Clamp just so I can get refill my hand and have fun in this game again yeah, is yeah, worth yeah, something. Yeah. All right, this next category you typed as Synergy Adjacent. What did you mean by that? <laughs> so uh, if you live in L.A., in a lot of places, but L.A. in particular is known for um, when you're looking for a place to live, a lot of places will be advertised as Beverly Hills Adjacent. <laughs> Which is like, we're not in Beverly Hills, but we want to put that name into our advertising so that you'll want to live here. It's good so marketing. We'll call it, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I wanted to call this Synergy Adjacent because these are cards that don't directly synergize with what the deck's doing, but they happen to work with enough stuff that's already going on that mm -hmm. I thought it would be fun to include. And this is really where the deck, you could, when you're deck building, you could take these slots and you could dedicate them towards more Nim Death Mantle combo type stuff. Right. There's a lot of things you could do, but most decks have, you know, four to five flex slots. And I like to try out some stuff in decks in these, you know, they're the 58th through 63rd card or whatever. Uh, so two of them are threaten effects because yep. we're running six, sac seven sack outlets, maybe eight. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I like this first one. You, This is a Jimmy card again. Well, you know why? This is to toot Jimmy's horn a little. Because Jimmy will play a card and be like, man, that card's really cool. I want to play that. So the next chance I have... <laughs> Well, I mean, it's great that you say that about me and about this card, but I don't know if you remember when I played this card in Game Nights, well, I had to... The card's cool. Maybe that usage wasn't the, the best. The usage wasn't the best. <laughs> in fact, I will say all of these cards that I love, I've never won a game with <laughs> on Game Nights because they've all, they've all come with mana screw, bad keeps. In this case, <laughs> sacrificing some of my own lands, but the card itself is Word of Seizing. It's three red red for an instant with split second, so as long as the spell is on the stack, players can't cast spells or activate abilities that aren't mana abilities. 
And it basically says as an instant untap target permanent and gain control of it until end of turn. It gains haste until end of turn. Now, untap target permanent. You can steal planeswalkers with this. You can take lands. Um, so it's actually got a little more flexibility. Just don't play it when you have a card that destroys your lands for tapping in at someone else's turn. <laughs> price of glory. Yeah, price of glory. <laughs> so I love Word of Seizing because split second and the fact that it hits any permanent, it's a real b good combo stopper. Yeah. It's a real good, like, a player thinks they're going to win on this turn and you play this card and they can't win on this turn anymore. Yeah, and you can t sometimes take the thing that's making them win. Yeah, a lot of times it's like, oh, they're going to, something's about to enter the battlefield and doubling season is out mm -hmm. and it's a planeswalker. You just take the doubling season, you know, and the planeswalker comes in, has normal loyalty abilities, and just it's like swipe it. Yeah, and it's like you got to give the doubling season back at the end of the turn, but they didn't just win, yeah. so you save the table from dying. But sometimes you can do better things, like take something on your turn, use it, mm -hmm. sacrifice it because you got all these sack outlets, and really set them back. So the versatility of this as a threat and effect, I really liked in the deck. Um, the other one is Mob Rule. It's four red red, and you for a sorcery, and you choose one. You either gain control of all creatures with power four or greater until end of turn, untap those creatures, and they gain haste. Or you gain control of all creatures with power three or less, untap them, and they gain haste. So you get all the big creatures, all the small creatures, whatever there's more of, probably. And if you have astronauts or something, you might get like five or six creatures, mm -hmm. sack them all, get some value off of it. You know, probably attack with them first, do some damage. It really can add up. Now, I chose these because everyone's probably thinking, well, why not insurrection or something? because it costs so much more mana, so much red. I figure mob rule is gonna do what you want most of the time. You right. probably take the big creatures and with Judith's ability when stuff dies, you ping down the little ones. Or if there's enough little ones, you can maybe finish off the big ones. Yeah, yeah. you, you just don't need to be sitting there with an insurrection in your hand that you just cannot use. Yeah, and even if you're trying to like, all right, well, I'm gonna ramp myself to get there. Uh, uh, nine, still a lot of mana ramp too. Is Unless you're going, I think it's eight. Unless you're yeah. going infinite, in which case you're already winning. Right. So. Uh, and the last one is one of our uh, misevaluated cards again. Torment of Hailfire! Pew, 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 pew! X, black, black for a sorcery. Repeat the process, falling process, X times. Each opponent loses three life unless that player sacrifices a non land permanent or discards a card. So if you're doing this for 10 mana, that's pretty brutal. If you're doing this for infinite mana, it's, you win the game. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, we were talking about all this stuff, all these loops you get into. And if you do this out, she pings everybody down. Yeah. If Judith's out, maybe she got killed a couple times. Maybe somebody saw the potential or whatever. Well, with Ashnod's Altar, even with just like mob rule, steal 10 creatures, sack them all to Ashnod's Altar, make 20 mana, add two black to it. Oh, yeah. Torment of Hellfire for... That's not infinite or anything, but Torment of Hellfire for 20 is going to win a lot of games. Yeah, and you just told everything that people can't even... They can't even sacrifice those permanents. They started to have to sacrifice other things. Ugh, yeah. It's rough. Yeah, Torment is just good in a deck that can explosively create a lot of mana, which this one could, because sometimes even just, you know, low-case scenario is you have five or six creatures, just sack it all to Ashna's altar and cast this thing. Yeah. And, you know, cross your fingers. Like, it could work. I've seen it work. Okay. The last category I wanted to talk about was new cards from Ravnica Allegiance. You know, it's fun when new sets come out to try out the new cards so you get a chance to see them in play and, and how they do. There's cards mm -hmm. that were like, we think they're going to be awesome, as we've seen, and they don't end up being good. And the way you find out, you know, whether you're right or wrong about evaluations is playing the cards. Yep. So I always try and put in a few new cards to decks, and these are three of them. You can pick which one you want to talk about. I'm going to talk about this yeah, one. Yeah, that one's sweet. <laughs> Electro Dominance. X red red instant. Electro Dominance deals X damage to any target, similar to Judith in terms of any target. And then here's the real kicker. You may cast a card with converted mana cost X or less from your hand without paying its mana cost. Sweet. Pretty sweet. Listen, if you... And there's two Any thing, card. <laughs> yeah. There's two things going on here, right? It's that it it sort of cheats something into play at instant speed. At one time, Videlkin Ori is something, so of course I like it, right? Mm -hmm. If you pay red, red, and six, you hit some... You deal six damage to any target, and you put a six drop, you cast it. Yeah. You could cast Machaeus. Yep. You could also... I mean... It, yeah, it's you nuts. could instant speed Machaeus at the end of your turn and then go off during your turn, right? Grave Titan. I mean, there's so many things. Even at the three mana spot, if you do this early on, it still gets another card out of your hand and gets your combo going. Maybe someone goes like, okay, he only has one piece of his combo. We have to be worried when he has two out. Yeah, and he doesn't have a Dalkin Ori or anything, so we're going to be able to see it coming. Yeah, end step, boom, here you go. Yep. Electro Dominance, kill the thing that's also stopping you from going off, and all of a sudden you're in the position to win the game. Yeah, put my Nim Death Mantle into play at instant speed. You didn't see that coming. Nope. That kind of thing. 
Godo Bandit Warlords a really good one, right? Because yeah. it gets that and your equipment into play at instant speed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I really like Electric Dominance. I think it's going to be in a lot of red decks. I, it's just the type of card that... Especially like, if you're mono red. It just has so much value attached to it that red doesn't normally get. I would consider playing a card that was red red. You can cast a spell from your hand at instant speed. Oh, by P- NX, whatever the CMC. The next the spell you cast, you know, the next spell oh, you cast has flash or whatever. Yeah. I mean, Quicken is kind of that. It draws a card and it's one blue. But I would at least consider a card that was just red, red, do that. Yeah. It's I probably not that. quite good enough. If it said red, red, draw a card and do that, which this, oh, oh, oh. this kind of does. The card you draw is deal X damage to something. Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. So I like that card a lot. I think it's very good. The next one I was less sure of, but I do think it's good in this deck. It's Theater of Horrors. It's one black red for an enchantment. At the beginning of your upkeep, exile the top card of your library. During your turn, if an opponent has lost life this turn, you may play cards exiled with Theater of Horrors. And then for three and a red, you can have Theater of Horrors deal one damage to target opponent or planeswalker. <clears throat> so it's kind of like Outpost Siege mm-hmm. or something like that. At the beginning of your turn, you exile the top card of your library. And then if during your turn, you can deal damage to your opponent, any opponent, any amount... Judith Dove does that does that quite well. Yep. Then you can play, and here's the real thing I think that makes it a little bit better than it looks. You can play any of the cards that have been exiled with Theater of Horrors. Yep. So let's say you played it, and on the next turn you didn't manage to deal damage to any of your opponents. And then on the next turn you didn't, and on the next turn you didn't. Well, now the fourth turn you do, you have access to all four of the cards that have already been... Yeah. So you could play one of the lands, then cast two of the spells. So you have a chance, even if you miss a turn, whereas Outpost Siege, you have to play it in that turn. And then it's gone. So if you draw like, you know, a counter spell, it's worthless. If you draw, I don't know, uh, usually if it's a land, you'll play the land. But if it's a spell that's like seven mana, but you've only got five mana, Mm -hmm. it's just gone. You didn't draw that card. Yeah, I like Theater of Horrors a lot. It also has an activated ability to do damage and let you get there. But Judith is already going to be doing a lot of this. What you said, though, you get to keep the cards around. Even if you are doing damage on those turns, you're like, I don't want to play this card yet. It's Electrodominance. I want to wait till I have more mana. Great. Well, you have to. The only downside is that you can't cast instant speed stuff on someone else's turn if you deal damage to them on that turn. You have to wait for your turn to do it. But honestly, this is the kind of deck I think wants to go off on your turn. So. Yeah, I agree. And there's also a lot of little sneaky ways to deal damage. Like you have Basilisk Collar and just putting it on a squee mm-hmm. and swinging is like nobody wants to block that thing because yeah. it's like you're not losing anything and they're losing a creature usually. Right. That's actually a good point. Your creatures don't matter if they're tapped or not. So you could, if you had an army of creatures, you could just swing at someone. You don't care if they, you know, Nether Traders got Shadow. It can't be blocked. Blood yeah. Gas, you don't care if it dies. You're going to play a land that's going to come back. Yeah. That's actually really interesting. Yeah, so you and and you have a lot of early drops. So a lot of times you play this on turn three, and on turn four you've got you know a couple of little creatures, and you just look around and be like, well, somebody you can attack. Yeah. And then the other times you have Judith's ability to kind of ping somebody for one just to give you access to these cards. So I, I do think it's good. And I guess we can't forget the fact that she does give your creatures plus one plus zero. Oh. Yeah, yeah, it so. does matter. I mean, Blood Gas as a three power creature is a lot worse. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot worse for your opponents, a lot better for you. Yeah, this deck is cool. It kind of grinds people out in a number of ways, and you kind of get to choose your own adventure each time. Sometimes you'll never be able to attack once in the whole game. The other times, you're doing that and doing Judith stuff, so you're not as reliant on some certain parts of the deck to make it function, but you're still taking everyone down quickly. Uh, and the last Ravnica Allegiance card we're going to talk about that's in the deck is one that's probably going to go in a lot of decks mm-hmm. uh, that have these colors. It's Bedevil. The art on this card is mm, crazy I awesome. I love Bedeviled yeah. Eggs. <laughs> it's uh, Seb McKinnon, and the art is sweet. It's sweet. black, black, and red for an instant. It says, very simple, destroy target artifact, creature, or planeswalker. So it's just a better um, hero's downfall, right? Yeah. It adds artifact to the mix. Obviously, it's harder to cast than hero's downfall, but if you have black and red, Bedevil seems awesome. Yeah, it gets an artifact too. It, yeah. It's very flexible. I Again, I, I could see a lot of people playing this card just for its flexibility, especially if you're black and red, don't have access to white. You know what I'm interested in? Where's the card that says destroy target player? <laughs> you know, why don't they make one of those? I guess Terminal of Hailfire is kind of that. <laughs> destroy targets players. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so that is the Judith, the Scourge, Diva deck. Can you finally shuffle this? Yeah, you can. Oh. I know, it's hard to hold the cards and not shuffle. I was like, I've got Just them in once. order. Don't shuffle them. <laughs> Does it feel good? Yeah, it feels great. Well, those Ultra Pro sleeves, you know, they always feel good. They do. Uh, so 
this deck is actually a lot of fun to play. I've played it a few times since we did the game nights. Of course, I won't give away the ending of that, but I was surprised at the power level. There's a lot of cross synergy, and you find things as you're playing is like, oh, I can do this. I can sack mm -hmm. this to cast this early. You know, oh, I can steal your creature and do this things because the just a little bit of threat and effects make it a lot more fun. Yeah, having options too, I think, is always great. Even though it seems like a deck might be linear, if you can build the deck in a way that lets you take, you know, choose your own adventure. You know, which way do you want to go with it? Banner snatch it. I think that's a lot, a lot more fun to play and to play again over the long run. I mean, that's kind of why you like your file smasher deck, right? Because right. you never really know what's going to happen with the damage. So, to the listeners. What do you think about the Judith deck? Are there any cards you think are must-includes that we missed? We'd love to hear it in the comments. You can tweet at us. You can send us emails. Uh, again, we like to take advantage of our brain trust. For people that have watched the episode maybe months, years down the line, they can look into the comments and see some of pe other people's suggestions. Yeah, or new cards that have come out since this episode has released. For sure. And hey, if those cards are something that you want to purchase for yourself, Make sure you use our affiliate link, cardkingdom.com slash command zone. You're going to be buying the cards anyway. It costs you nothing except for maybe the extra three seconds to type that URL in. Or if it's bookmarked, just clicking it. Buy those cards, get them shipped to you super fast. Again, they have incredible customer service and uh, one of the best in the biz, undoubtedly. Yeah, Card Kingdom is awesome. And our other sponsor, and I want to call out that I did put, we all did for game nights. We all mm -hmm. put our decks into the guild theme sleeve. So this it's is, of so course, cool. Rakdos, which I think is one of the cooler. I, I'm just a red and black is yeah. a color pairing that I like. Um, and so I just think these sleeves look sweet. And as Jimmy just said, they feel awesome when you're shuffling them. You know, in the past, these sleeves that have like printed backs have been harder. Yeah, harder. Yeah, they've, they've been like harder to shuffle and they kind of come apart more. But I've played this deck many times. The deck still feels great to shuffle and these sleeves are not coming apart. Like these things are very, very strong. You you saw yeah. us if you watched um when, when DJ was co-hosting. We had DJ who's like six foot three. He's a big dude. Try and do the uh oh, the, the stretch test, test yeah. and he and he could barely do it. It took him like a lot of pressure to wow. pull these apart. That's so, cool. Yeah, they are difficult. They are definitely uh, high quality. So check out Ultra Pro products. Okay, now it's time for the end step where we talk about something cool outside the world of magic. I heard you reference it. Yeah, that's right. So I'm assuming that means you've watched it now? Yeah, but I don't want to give anything away right. other than the fact that I think that this is the future of entertainment. So we're talking <laughs> about Bandersnatch, which is a Netflix... It's an episode of a, a Netflix series called Black Mirror. Which is great if you haven't seen it before. Black Mirror sweet. Check it out. But I think if, we've ended up Black Mirror before. Probably. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But this is the new episode, but it's... It, well, why don't you explain it? Um, Just the concept of what the show. Right. So Black Mirror is is sort of like an alternate reality Twilight slash Zone. Twilight Zone-esque, but very much on the dark side of things. And Banner Snatch is an episode that they released that is interactive. And it basically is kind of like a game in a lot of ways, but you're able to use your remote or whatever you access Netflix on to, at certain key points in the story, choose, are you going to do X or Y? And It's, it's choose your own adventure. It's choose your own adventure. There are different endings. There are different ways to go about it. Um, and it's very meta as well. I think Black Mirror has always been very good at that, sort of like a show that references itself within the show. Um, and this episode is very much that. So I personally enjoyed it. I didn't think it was amazing, but I liked the concept and the execution. And I think it spells out a lot of what could be a big future for stuff on that platform in the future. Yeah, I agree. I think the show was good. It was fine. I was entertained. I don't think it's the best incarnation of this idea, but it definitely shows. Yeah. It opens up a whole new avenue of possibilities where you're like, whoa, as you're doing it, you're like, oh, this could be amazing. Yeah. I mean, imagine if it was tied to something that was more of a live show and it was yeah. like, hey, guys, vote oh. on something. Oh, gosh. You know, you have your remote right there and it's not going to stop the process. But I think the idea of Netflix want to create more of a game environment and interactivity, I think they bought the rights to a certain card game like oh really yeah something like very basic or something like monopoly or something because i think that's kind of where netflix might be going and banner snatches i could totally see the black mirror guys being like we want to do this and netflix being like cool this lines up with what we're trying to aim for in the future yeah very cool so banner snatch on netflix if you haven't seen it check it out another thing to check out is our sister podcast the masters of modern alex kessler and ben bateman they talk about the modern format all things competitive magic if you're getting into uh arena i've been playing a lot lately and a lot of their mindset is really useful in Arena because it is like you're laddering and you're trying to rank up. Mm -hmm. And so that's just sort of a different thing than commander players are used to. So those guys are definitely good to check out. 
you know, I've learned a lot just listening to their episodes about like, hey, in limited, you should just mulligan a lot less or just little things like that can help you win, you know, 10% more games, which is a big deal. You earn more gold, Mm -hmm. more gems. In my case, it's about mulliganing more often because I keep awful hands. (laughs) Unless I'm playing Momer Vig, in which case, bam, (laughs) snap keep every time. Yeah. (laughs) So you can find the Masters of Modern if you just type that into the search bar on on YouTube. They have uh, videos. And also, you can find them right next to us at Collected.Company. Or you can follow them on Twitter. They're at the MMCast. All right. Our editor for the show is Josh Murphy, a.k.a. Murph. Murph. There's a mode in League of Legends called Earth Mode where they go, Murph. So that's how I'm going to say it, Murph, from now on. Special thanks to Jeffrey Palmer, who does the awesome living card animations, both that start and end the show, as well as behind us here on the screen today, we have a little bit of uh, Invocation Madness. Yeah, this is Days. Really cool, actually. Pretty sweet. Yeah, pretty sweet. So thank you. You can find Jeffrey online at Living Cards MTG at Twitter. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching. And we'll see you next time. Peace. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs>